Hello, and welcome to our weekly dialogue with Helga Zepp-LaRouche. She is the founder and chairwoman of the Schiller Institute. Today is March 27th, 2024. I'm Harley Schlanger, and I'll be your host. You can send us your questions and comments via email to questions at schillerinstitute.org or post them on the YouTube chat page. Helga, let's begin with some developments from the last couple of days. Uh, first, there was the UN Security Council vote on a new resolution calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. This time it passed, 14-4 and one abstention. The US, instead of vetoing it, abstained from it, which means it passed. And also then the filing in Geneva of a report by the UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights in the Occupied Palestinian Territories, Francesca Albanese, who said that the time is now to stop genocide against the Palestinians. Now, a viewer has written to us saying, the pressure on Biden is obviously increasing to get a settlement, as is the pressure on Netanyahu to stop the genocide. But what more must be done to assure compliance on a ceasefire and move to a real peace in the Middle East? And she writes, I have registered for the Oasis Plan Conference. So that's, those are the first questions for you. Well, I think that the UN Security Council vote is mandatory, but obviously, you know, that is then the question if Israel will uh, regard that as uh, obligatory to follow. And if not, then the question is, you know, what other measures uh, must be uh, taken. Um, in, in any case, you know, I think that, you know, we can only suggest to change the entire outlook. Uh, that is why the OASIS uh, conference, I think, must really be a powerful intervention. And I think what, what you can do is to help us to build the conference, get as many individuals, but also organizations uh, from the region, from Southwest Asia, but also from the United States and from Europe and other parts of the world to, you know, put in their weight, because I think this is so enormous, you know, naturally the United States could have stopped it, uh, you know, from the very beginning. Uh, now they are under pressure to, to do something, but, you know, the big question is, will they? And I think the only thing one can do is to have a, you know, if you had the whole world like a powerful cause demanding that the suffering of the people in the region should stop and that therefore the oasis plan uh, should be implemented you know just imagine the BRICS countries would all say that if all the neighbors would say it uh, saudi arabia the emirates iraq um, syria turkey and then beyond that all the other countries of europe and everybody would demand that it could happen so that is the purpose of this oasis uh, conference that we build the momentum and show people a vision, you know, how actually <clears throat> through economic development, a peace can be established. But I think it does require like everything else in this incredibly dangerous moment in history, it does require an enormous amount of mobilization of people of goodwill. So help us build this conference and, you know, help us by pointing out people we should contact, people you are contacting, get mayors, city councils, uh, congressmen, parliamentarians to endorse it. You know, the more we have of such voices, the better. Now, the conference is an online conference, and you can register for it at the theschillerinstitute.com. It's April 13th, and this is one of these moments in history where the kind of discussion that is going to take place will be outside of the control of the establishment, which means we can assure that it will be an honest, serious discussion. So take what Helga is saying and, and help us build for it. Now, Helga, on that, there were a couple of questions that came in, a couple of emails on the same general idea of what you were just proposing. Um, the, for example, Sybil writes, the system is collapsing, its leaders have little support. Uh, what about a call for a global general strike? And someone else wrote, what about an international day of action? Uh, are there other ideas that the Schiller Institute has that can move the situation uh, much quicker in the right direction? Well, 
in theory, that would be a, a good idea, but I, I don't know how practical it is. I mean, if we would call for an international strike, who would follow? Or an international day of action, that sounds more, more practical. But I think the way to look at it is, you know, um, that I think we have to organize people on the idea that we need a completely different approach because, you know, we are really on the verge of World War III. Um, the uh, Veterans for Sanity and Intelligence, this is a group of uh, American dissidents, one can say, formerly working for the military, the CIA, State Department, um, and they have formed this organization called the VIPs, the Veterans for, Intellig for Sanity and Intelligence. They just wrote this incredibly important memorandum, uh, an appeal to Biden, to President Biden, uh, <clears throat> on the brink of nuclear war, uh, where they take the proposal by President Macron uh, to send French troops, um, <clears throat> any troops, but French troops into Ukraine, and there are rumors that there are already 2,000 troops uh, prepared to be sent. And they warn that that will, you know, both lead the Europeans into a nuclear war as well as straw, if not stop, uh, <clears throat> the uh, United States uh, into what could become annihilation. So this is very important because I think that that is the reality and we probably will get more into this in terms of this terrorist attack. If you look at the situation, you know, we are in, in a completely out of control situation. And therefore, the quicker we initiate a discussion that we are the intelligent human species, we are, we should be gifted with reason and capable of defining solutions out of a seemingly hopeless situation. That is why uh, I have proposed since now about two years the idea of a new security and development architecture, which must take into account the interests of every single country. And I think that is a concept which I think is, is extremely important for people to start to discuss, to think about, you know, what would it mean to create a world order where you know every nation can live because if we do not get of this geopolitical confrontation between NATO on the one side, Russia, China on the other side, you know a, a little mistake. You know there are people who say, oh no, this will never happen. They won't let it occur. Well, if you look at the history before World War One and the history before World War Two, you can clearly identify in each case the moment when it was too late. You don't know that into the future because, you know, there is such a thing as free will and you can always change the dynamic. But looking back in history, you can definitely say at that moment it was too late. And we are right now in such a period where, you know, nobody knows, but a lot of people are absolutely scared because the, you know, the present establishments do not seem to be guided by wisdom, but you know, in parts by illusionary, uh, you know, dreams, and and uh, I think that's very scary. So I, my suggestion is we could think about an international day of action. Uh, we have now the uh, May demonstration next weekend, so you know we should in Europe we have um, many marches are being planned. You should go there, deploy. We have a leaflet on our website, um, which is called, uh, you know, we are on the verge of World War Three. Stop, stop the NATO war. Uh, and you, you can download this leaflet. If you don't have another one, take that one. Go to these May Day uh, marches. There are in many places in Europe and in, in the United States, there are church services take this leaflet, go there, distribute it, um, contact our offices and let's build because to make a day of action worldwide <clears throat> does require some preparation. But if you mobilize this coming weekend, that would be a first step. And then think about you know a larger uh, effort, which would be this idea of a new international security and development architecture that requires more organizing, but you can enter that discussion with us right now. 
Now, we have an email from a contact from Palestine who was quite upset by the meeting that took place between Israel's Defense Minister Gallant and Lloyd Austin, the U.S. Defense Secretary. And he said that, uh, what a hypocrite. Austin said more must be done for humanitarian concerns for the Palestinians, but he that the United States will continue to support Israel. And he said, don't they see children are dying every day, mothers are dying, grandparents are dying, there's starvation everywhere. Don't they see that the world is looking at them as a bunch of immoral, evil hypocrites? Well, I think the uh, report which you mentioned in the beginning by Francesca Albanese, who is the special rapporteur, she made the speech um, yesterday in Geneva in front of the Human Rights Council, where she presented her findings of what she calls an anatomy of genocide. And she goes again through all the, all the arguments and, and descriptions which we know already from the International Court of Justice. Yes, you are absolutely right. It is genocide. It is perpetrated in front of the eyes of the world public. And, you know, I have said this a uh, long time ago. This is the moral test. If we cannot stop that, if we cannot, you know, intervene in such a way to, to, to immediately stop this, you know, this falls back on, you know, are we, are we morally fit to survive as a human species? And I'm afraid to say that for some places, uh, the answer is uh, almost clearly no, because see, if you have governments who, after all of this evidence is being presented and accessible, you know, it's not like with the Nazis uh, 80 years ago. Yeah, there people could with some credibility claim that they didn't know and that, you know, is still being discussed by and investigated by historians of how much did people know and the majority for sure could not know and did not know because there was an effort to conceal it. But in this case, there is no effort to conceal it. It's it's out there in front of the eyes of the world. And therefore, you know, I think that that is really a, a, a test of our ability to, to survive as a, as a human species. Are we humans or are we not? So it's, um, I can only say we can only mobilize as much as we can uh, to try to, to shift this in the way we discussed it before with the OASIS plan. And Helga, you mentioned the VIPS memo, the Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity, uh, the French road to nuclear war with their warnings about Macron. There was another similar comment this week uh, by Viktor Orban, the president of Hungary, who referred to the talk of the war hawks at the European Union summit backing the Macron proposal uh, as he said it was like entering a second galaxy. So a friend of the Schiller Institute in Europe said that while these kind of interventions are crucial, are there others in Europe speaking out against global NATO and what can be done to bring more people out? Well, I, I think there are, you know, there are people, I mean, I think the image which um, Prime Minister Orban uses about the two galaxies, uh, that's exactly it, because, you know, you have sometimes the feeling there are people like probably many of those watching this uh, program who are extremely concerned that the present geopolitical confrontation is is bringing mankind into a danger like never before. And I think, you know, who are aware of the fact that because of the breakdown of trust, breakdown of all the armament, uh, disarmament uh, agreements and, and arms control agreements, that the present situation is much, much more dangerous than at the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Because at that time, Kennedy and Khrushchev did still, you know, talk to each other. There were back channel discussions, so the situation could be diffused. Now, you know, if you had, like after this terrorist attack, you know, if it comes out that links, that traces would go to the Anglo-American countries, you know, which is mooted, that, you know, Putin and, and um, the FSB basically said that, you know, they're investigating that who is who gave the order to ISIS 
uh, to conduct these terrorist attacks. If that leads to countries in the West, we could be in a in a situation much worse than the Cuban Missile Crisis in 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 minutes. And you know, therefore, I think you know there are people who are concerned with that. And we know many of them, not all of them, but it's a I would say a significant minority. But then you have the other galaxy, and these are people. They say, oh, the Russians are only bluffing. Don't worry, you know, we crossed already so many red lines and they didn't do anything, so let's cross another red line. And, you know, I think that that is really scary because the people who are in that other galaxy seem to be completely numb in terms of the danger that represents for for the entire existence of civilization. And I think the main problem we have is that the NATO apparatus is controlling the narrative. Um, sometimes little cracks occur, like Victoria Nuland losing her position. These are little cracks in the in the whole thing. But for the most part, you know, I think the 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 key question is: Can we mobilize the conscience and the sense of you know self that self protection self uh, reliance in in the globe in the majority of that other galaxy in time. We are listening to Helga Zaplarouche, the founder of the Schiller Institute and the current chairwoman of the Schiller Institute. We can still take your questions, and you can send them to us at questions at schillerinstitute dot org. Uh, I do have a question for you that came in on the terror attack in Moscow, and this person writes. Whether it was Ukraine or not that was directly behind it, the authors behind this are the same as those who are behind the proxy war with the intent to destroy Russia. Uh, and you can see it from some of the neocons who are gleeful about this happening against Russia. Uh, it's clear they have no humanity. But what does this say about the problems in the Western media, the continued attack on Russia saying that uh, this is Putin's fault. Putin deserved it. Uh, just, just the, the question is, what can you say about the, overall this attack that occurred in Moscow? Well, <clears throat> I think that the um, one one argument I I was reading was earlier. You know, in civilized societies, you would condemn any kind of terrorism, no matter who is the target. And somebody said, you know, when some atrocity happened in Ukraine, in Berlin, the Brandenburger Tor was uh, illuminated in the colors of Ukraine, yellow, uh, blue. Uh, so is the Brandenburger Tor being illuminated now in the Russian colors? Obviously not. Uh, so that's, you know, reflecting on, you know, that the, the, the world is not civilized and people are condoning things which are totally, I mean, totally unhuman. But I think this is really a, a very dangerous moment because uh, Putin just met with the uh, prosecutors and investigators and other officials uh, and obviously instructed them, you know, to conduct the investigation. And if it turns out that uh, it was not just this ISIS, which, you know, the cui bono, Putin raised the cui bono, who, who would profit from it? And I can only advise people, look at the uh, video my late husband, Lyndon LaRouche, made in 1999. It's a two and a half hour video called Storm Over Asia. But if you look at the first 10, 15 minutes of it, it is absolutely breathtaking because he says uh, he locates uh, this was at the time, you know, the, the wars in the North Caucasus. And he, he said that the people who have been involved in the great game for a very long time, they have these uh, terrorist mercenaries, which are recruited and deployed for whatever purposes in, in the destabilization against Russia, China, um, Iran. And if you listen to Lin LaRouche in that video, just listen to the first 10 minutes and you will get a, a an absolute grasp about you know what is happening now if you replace north caucasus with ukraine everything else is is fitting for for the situation today 
And I think it is that deep rooted great game destabilization, you know, of trying to dismantle Russia. And nowadays you have the Jamestown Foundation, you have this other organization which is called Free Nations in the Post-Russia Forum or something like that. And they are definitely uh, talking and probably not only talking about dismantling Russia, cutting it into, you know, 12 or more pieces. And I think the Russians are extremely aware of the fact and that's why, you know, when we cross the line and Putin has reaffirmed he's not changing the nuclear doctrine of Russia, which uh, this uh, Sergei Karaganov had uh, suggested, uh, Putin said no, that he will not change the nuclear doctrine, which says that if the territory of Russia is threatened, then, you know, Russia is, uh, you know, probably employing nuclear weapons. But I, I, my whole reading of the situation is that, you know, anybody who is playing with the use of nuclear weapons as a means to settle this conflict is, is clinically insane. And I'm pretty much convinced, you know, that both China and Russia will do everything possible to not use nuclear weapons. But if you have these kinds of destabilizations, you know, it's not, wars never work as they are planned. You have an incident, you had in the reaction, you know, to this terrorist attack, there was an incursion, I think in the airspace where a Russian fighter jet for 39 seconds or so entered the Polish airspace and immediately naturally other fighter planes took off. It's these kinds of, of you know, little things which could trigger a catastrophe and we should not forget that right now we still have until May this uh, very large NATO maneuver called Steadfast um, Defender uh, 2024 where 90,000 troops are being deployed and they're rehearsing the transference of large numbers of troops and so forth. It's these kinds of maneuvers which could go into reality very quickly if some accident occurs. That's why I'm, I'm asking for a change in mentality that we have to stop this thinking that, you know, and right now I think it's, um, it's really on the edge. Okay, now here's a question for you from someone from Italy. Uh, saying that they rely on the Schiller Institute for an, an analysis of what's happening in Europe. And they write, what happened to the Maloney government? Supposedly it was going to be uh, anti-NATO, possibly anti-European Union. Instead, it's become pro-war, pro-NATO. And they also uh, broke the memo of understanding with the Belt and Road Initiative. What happened? Well, I think, you know, it's exactly what, you know, happened many times that, you know, somebody claims to be for sovereignty of a country, like in that case, Italy, or in France, uh, there are many sovereignists. But then when push comes to shove, you know, somehow the strings are pulled and then people are pro-European Union, pro-NATO, pro-war, pro pro, -war, pro, -pro, -pro weapons delivery to all kinds of places and you know i think that that is unfortunately what the the present system works in such a way that they have their cluster agents their you know their uh, agents of influence and they make sure that each organization is staying in in line and you can actually make a list of such people you know in journalism in in the political parties um, who have that kind of a role. And unless people start to recognize that as part of the system of control, um, I think it will work that way. I think concerning the memorandum of, of understanding, um, I mean, right now, there is an enormous pressure by the EU to not have uh, relations with uh, Russia and China. This plays out right now, for example, in Western Balkans. Uh, there are elections in the next several days, and um, uh, President Vucic said that in the next two, two three days, there will be enormous challenges uh, in his country. So I think there is an enormous effort to, to try to prevent such a thing. But on the other side, 
you know, I think the <clears throat> voice of the global south, of the countries who suffered from colonialism for 600 years, you know, even if they are all under attack, you see what happens in Egypt right now with the IMF in Ethiopia, also similar. There is now a new scandal being discovered in South Africa. Uh, Argentina is uh, under massive attack, naturally, with uh, Mila in there. So I think it, it's not a battle without difficulties. But given the fact that the global South is the global majority, they represent 85 or so of the world population. Um, you know, I think that the danger is that that everything, everybody is being uh, pulled down. But I'm also quite confident that the majority of the countries of the world right now with the BRICS plus, that there is actually an effort to create a new economic system uh, where everybody can actually develop and, and develop their own resources and become, you know, not, not, not super rich, but to have a decent living standard for all of their people. That is a wish and that is the trend of the time, which I think is stronger than all the efforts of destabilization. Well, in response to what you've been discussing, we have two new questions that just came in. One is, how can basic beliefs and social values be depoliticized voluntarily and not forcibly? And related to that uh, is the question, the Schiller Institute emphasis on cultural dialogue against the great game uh, is so important based on the concept from your fundamental principles that all human beings are made in the image and likeness of God. Is there an effort underway to get more artists to speak out as part of the bigger effort of the International Peace Coalition? Yes, um, I, I just this morning had a very good discussion with some friends about the need to strengthen the dialogue of civilizations. Because, you know, I mean, I think many of our viewers, that's you, uh, probably in these very, very difficult days, sometimes have the feeling that the whole world is becoming so horrible. Many people say, I don't watch the news anymore because, you know, it's just one horror show after the other, that it is so important to keep a sense of beauty, to keep a sense of creativity, to keep a sense of, you know, what mankind is capable of in a positive way, which is expressed in the composition of classical music, of beautiful poetry, of beautiful paintings. So I, I will take your question as a, as a reminder and as an encouragement to, you know, we, we will have many, many uh, efforts to organize classical concerts, a dialogue of civilization representing the best expressions of, you know, Chinese culture, European culture, African culture, and have that become, you know, what is the substance of discussion among people. I think this is so important to uplift the soul because this, you know, sort of having a vision of what mankind should be and that should motivate us to try to realize it in reality rather than proceeding from reality and then going straight to hell because that's where it seems to lead to. So I think the task of the poems, the poets and musicians to uplift people is more important than ever before. So if you are an artist, contact us, help us to build concerts and such dialogues of culture. And I have one, one more question from someone who identifies herself as an old friend of uh, the late departed Renee Segerson, who says that she's very hopeful that the LaRouche Legacy Foundation will be putting out more material and making it available and asks, where does that pro pro uh, program stand right now? Oh, that is making uh, definitely progress. We have now the second volume of collected works of Lyndon LaRouche at the printer. Uh, so you can expect that to come out fairly soon. That will be a beautiful collection um, of especially cultural writings on music and poetry. Uh, you should definitely put in an order right now if you hear it. 
um, and then the Laouche Library, which you know is uh, being uh, developed by the Laouche Legacy Foundation, is also making uh, tremendous progress. So uh, you should go to the to the uh, to the website and and look for it for yourself. It's an enormous amount of work because my late husband was an extremely prolific writer. You know, in in the times when he was in his best uh, capacity, he would write up to eighty pages a day, and not just you know articles, but with footnotes, with you know graphics, with with everything, so that the editorial actually had almost no work to to finish the article for production. Um, and so he has written, I would say, the equivalent of, I would say, over a hundred books and thousands of articles and um, then naturally many videos, audios, communications of all kinds. So it's an enormous uh, work, but we will make it all available because I think, you know, to study Lyndon LaRouche at this time, to study his economic theories, uh, to study his analysis of history, his incredible insights into classical composition, that is, I would say, the most important uh, things you can read at this moment. Well, Helga, those are the only questions I have for you. I, I think it would be useful in, in summary for you to once again give people a sense of what the intention is from this OASIS conference that we have on April 13th. Well, I think that, you know, this coming Friday, first of all, we will have another uh, Zoom conference of the International Peace Coalition. This will be very important. Uh, so you should contact us to be connected and be part of it because we will have as guests uh, two or three members of the VIPs, these veterans of intelligence, of for sanity and intelligence, discussing the memorandum they wrote to uh, Biden on Macron's troops uh, bringing about you know the danger of nuclear war. We very likely will have uh, a leading retired military from France who will be in a dialogue uh, with these WIPS people. So that will be an extremely fascinating uh, event. I can tell you one of them will be Ray McGovern, there will be others. Uh, and so you should join that because you want to be part of an international peace coalition because we have to unify all peace loving people around the world to be strong enough because you have many groups here and there, but since they're not unified, their voice is not sufficient to really influence the policy. So that's the first thing. Then, you know, on the April 13th, um, you know, we will have this uh, Oasis Plan Conference. We will have an extraordinary um, combination of speakers from Palestine, from other countries from the region, from experts on water, on desalination on nuclear energy on you know all kinds of uh, aspects of the realization of the oasis plan and uh, try to help us to build that conference get it to all elected officials get it to all parliamentarians um, city councils state legislators mayors um, other groups who should be concerned and let's build a movement for peace through development. I think that's the most important thing you can do right now. Okay, well, I think that's all we have time for, Helga. Thanks for joining us this week. And as always, we expect to see you again next week. Yes, and try to become active with us. <laughs>